I'm going to start today's presentation by telling you how to make the perfect pitcher of Kool-Aid. Did you really just say that to them? Yes, that's what we're going to do today. <laughs> and I know this is crazy, but bear with me. So here's how you do it. Well, let's first of all talk about the wrong way to do it. Most people just put the Kool-Aid in the sugar in the bottom of the pitcher, then they put the water in, but then you get little crusties in the bottom and that's no good for anybody, right? Other people put the water in, then the Kool-Aid and the sugar on top, and then you get little floaties, also not good, because that's just gross, and then you get this bad distribution of flavor crystals to water. The right way to do it, people, listen very carefully, you put about this much water, a couple inches of water in the bottom of the pitcher, then you put the Kool-Aid in, then you put the sugar or sweetener in there, right? Then you'd think you're, you're just put water in there. No, now you gotta start stirring it. Start stirring it, get it going real good, like a little tornado, right? A little red tornado like you used to have in elementary school. And then you put some more water on top. Now, before you finish filling the pitcher, you're gonna wanna put some ice in there because the last person that drank the Kool-Aid, they left the pitcher. Now you wanted Kool-Aid, you want the next glass, so you put ice in it, but you gotta put about three cups of ice. No more, no less. If you put too much ice in, then your first few glasses of Kool-Aid are gonna be way too strong, and then your last few glasses of Kool-Aid after the ice melts are gonna be way too watery. So, water, Kool-Aid, sugar, more water, stirring, ice, more water, perfect Kool-Aid. Got it? Now, I don't think anyone left, but you are probably sitting there wondering what the heck kind of webinar you just joined. <laughs> now, I told you that story for three reasons. Number one, I want to set the tone for this webinar. This is, we've all been watching a lot of webinars lately now that we're staying at home. We're communicating through computer screens like this. We've been spending a lot of time with these kinds of webinars. I, I don't have a webinar for you guys like that. There will be no stats, no graphs, no charts, uh, no amazing quotes or facts. This is, this is a storytelling webinar. Now, I really believe you're going to get a lot out of it, and I think that you're going to walk away saying this may be one of the best webinars you've ever seen. <laughs> Way to set yourself up there. But I, it's not going to be a regular webinar, okay? Number two reason is because I want to help identify a couple of different people in the audience. There are people who are like me, who really want that perfect Kool-Aid and really want to tell other people how to do things, right? You, you, you got this personality type that you just need everything to be your way, right? When I talk to people about my book, about these webinars, about these everyday lessons, I hear from two kinds of people, people who say that they're like me and that they identify with me. Some of them have said, David, how'd you get in my head? You're just as nuts as me. And we share this, uh, this camaraderie, right? If you're that type of person, I'm gonna call you uh, an A, part of the A crowd, right? The other people that are here joining me today and are listening, you're the B crowd. You're, you're, you're probably married to someone like me or you live with someone like me and you won't necessarily uh, connect with me in the same way that the A's do, but I'm hoping that by the end of this webinar, you'll have a little more insight into that person that you live with and you'll maybe understand why they tick the way that they do and maybe even be able to help them with some of that craziness that they're dealing with. Um, and, you know, in fact, everybody just throw in the chat real quick. Are you an A or a B? I'd love to know kind of what I'm, what I'm working with today. Are you crazy like me and you want the world to get in line and follow your instructions? Or do you just like, you don't understand people like that and they need to all chill out? I got some A's, I got a B, more A's. Okay, lots of A's, I love it, lots of it. Okay, so I can officially tell people now I got all A's and B's on my webinar. <laughs> the third reason that I started the webinar with that Kool-Aid story is because it's just more fun than a bio, right? It's more, it's more interesting than hearing about ooh, who is this speaker, right? Um, but we do need to do that because a lot of you don't know me, you don't know what my story is, and I think that Knowing my story, that that's the foundation of why we're here together, it will help lead us into, uh, into, the, uh, into the everyday lessons that I'm going to share with you today, okay? All right, so first of all, I have been an, an internet marketing consultant for a long time. I, I sold Yellow Pages 100 years ago. Uh, today, I really just, uh, I, work on in, I work with a big internet company. 
uh, based in Fort Worth. I live in Kansas City and I am the sales trainer uh, for this company. And basically I'm doing pretty good. You know, I'm two people away from the CEO. Um, I have a lot of responsibility. I have a nice income. I have a, a nice home. I have a beautiful wife, beautiful car. Notice I put beautiful wife first. Um, you know, two great kids. Um, my training has been visited by, I have this, uh, this internet marketing training platform that I've been building for the last seven years. And it's been reviewed or about 26,000 sales reps have gone through my training. My wife teases me. She says I'm internet famous, right? Um, and I also train a lot of people in person. Some of you guys I've met in person, right? And um, I, there's actually a little bit of a waiting list, not right now during COVID, but normally there's about a four month waiting list for me to come visit someone. So um, that all sounds very braggy and I don't mean it to, but the reality is that I kind of had this sense of importance that I didn't really deserve. I, uh, I, I felt like I was a big deal. You know, I was, I had all these people treated me with such respect in my career, but at home, things were not going so great. Um, at home, the reality is that at home that I was, uh, I was struggling quite a bit with my relationships with my family uh, and my friendships. I was so focused on my career. And I think this happens to a lot of people. I'm 49 now and I was 47 going through this uh, phase of my life. Um, I think a lot of people find that they focus so heavily on their career and becoming financially successful and career successful that they neglect the important parts of their lives, the relationships. And that definitely happened with me. In fact, I was super short tempered uh, with my family. Like everything in, you know, just, just drove me nuts. Um, in fact, it got so bad. So my daughter's 14 now. Um, at the time, you know, a couple years ago, she was leaving her lights on all the time. Uh, you know, she'd leave the footstool up and I'd hit my shin on it. She'd leave clothes all over the place. She'd leave dirty dishes. I once went in her room and found fried rice that was three months old. I, I don't even know how that happens, right? And um, the light thing got to me so bad, I begged, I grounded, I pleaded. At one point, I actually, um, when she was at school, I actually went into her room and I stole her light bulbs. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to talk about this, but I, I was that nuts. I took her light bulbs away from her. She came home from school, this poor little, what is that, seventh or eighth grade, right? And she's like, dad, I don't even have any windows in my bathroom. I can't see. And I was like, I don't care. Use a flashlight. So this is the person that I was becoming at home. These, this is the person that my family was uh, forced to live with. Um, and, and it wasn't good, obviously. Um, in fact, it got so bad. We got to one point where I was, uh, I was heading out of town to go to a training and I had my wheeler, wheelie bag and I'm rolling through the kitchen. I'm like, bye guys, I'm, I'm, I'll see you in a few days. And they were at the island around the kitchen and they were all on their phones, eating cereal, whatever. And they kind of barely looked up and said, bye dad. Um, I think my wife gave me that obligatory kiss on the cheek, you know, and then I left. And I, and I remember thinking, um, that they were not sad to see me go. I remember thinking they're going to be so much happier for the next few days because the dictator is out of the house. You know, the old classic, when the cat's away, the mice will play. And then I thought, well, when did I become the cat? I used to be a mouse too. I used to just hang out with them and have fun. And now I've become this crazy person. And so I, I get on the plane and I'm flying to wherever I needed to go. Sorry. I'm flying to wherever I was going and I, um, I heard this song. Well, I didn't hear the song at that moment, but I remembered a song. I thought about a song. It's by Tim McGraw and Faith Hill. It's called Angry All the Time. And I don't know if you've heard it or not, but it's about a couple that is madly in love with each other, but they're splitting up because one of them is just so angry and the other one doesn't feel like they can make them happy anymore. And I remember thinking that that was the path that I was on. 
Now, a lot of self-improvement authors, they have to go down a very, very dark path where they lose their millions or their wife leaves them or they're suicidal. And then they make this miraculous change and they come back and they're, I think I got lucky. I think that might've been the path I was on, but I saw it early enough that I decided to make a change. And, uh, and so that's when I decided to go on my journey. I decided I was going to make some changes. And over the years, I've been a big self-improvement reader. I, um, I feel like books were one of the main reasons that I was catapulted to a financial and career success. How to win friends and influence people, think and grow rich, um, the power of positive thinking, um, Ogmandino books, all these books had really helped me. So here I am faced with a new challenge and I decided that I was going to utilize books again. So that's what I did. My journey became about reading books that would help me be a better father, a better husband, a better friend and coworker. I even picked up a book to help me come be, help me become <clears throat> a better son to my senior mother. And so I'm reading six or seven books at a time and I'm reading 20 minutes a day, every single day. And more than that, part of the journey, part of the process was to take those lessons that I learned and then write myself a note on my wrist, kind of like this, right? Just a little note to remind me of how to behave in a better manner, to be patient, to be kind, to be a better listener, all these different things. And what happened was I acted on those lessons and spoiler alert, happy ending. A, a year later, a lot had changed in my family and my home and, and there was a lot of peace. Today, um, Stacy and Cynthia have asked me to come share with you four of the lessons that I learned along the way. And I'm going to tell you right now, these are not lessons that you've never heard of. These are not some super secret thing. These are universal truths that you will have, you will know them, but I'm hoping that by the end of this webinar, you will be reminded um, to do these things and you will have a process that will help you become the better version of yourself. Now, before I jump right into them, I want to tell, tell you something I just recently learned. Um, I recently learned that when surveyed, oh, I said there were going to be no, no research, but I lied. Here's some research. The research said that only about one in 10 people is interested in self-improvement. Now, you guys are here. That tells me that you're probably one of those one in 10. The research goes on to say that 10 out of 10 people are interested in being happier. The funny thing is that when happiness research started happening in 2005, they discovered that the steps to becoming happy are almost identical to the steps that self-improvement had been talking about for many, many years. So there's our goal for the day. Stick around with me for a little while and you will learn to be a better version of yourself and hopefully it will make you and all the people around you happier. Good goals. Fair enough, everybody. All right. Lesson number one, my way isn't always the right way. Now, as af after hearing that Kool-Aid story, you, you probably get that I struggle with like things being done my way, right? In fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you guys, does the toilet paper go over or does the toilet paper come under? Is it an over thing or is it an under thing, right? Over, 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 <laughs> exactly. Well, let me tell you how my wife replaces the toilet paper and did for 20 years. She would take the new toilet paper and instead of taking the, the old roll off, she would just set the new one on its side on top of the old one. And for 20 years, every time that happened, I just did the next thing that I do. I, uh, I growled a little to myself. I, it visibly upset me. And then I would take the old roll off and I would replace it. Well, one of the very first books I read on my journey was a book called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, and It's All Small Stuff. And if you haven't read that book, get it on Amazon as soon as we're done, right? It helped me to put things into perspective. And um, what I learned was that it didn't matter how the toilet paper was on. It's not over or under. It, I'm just glad there's toilet paper there, right? And I learned something else that was really valuable. I, I left it alone. I left it and I said, I'm not, I'm not going to worry about it. And the most crazy thing happened. All of a sudden, the next day, 
the toilet paper was on the roll. What? My wife replaced it. For 20 years, this had been driving me nuts. And now I have learned that if I just wait a day, if I'm just a little more patient, she'll replace it. Stupidest stuff. But let's talk about that same lesson. My way isn't always right. Look at that. Um, in the workplace. Now, several years ago, um, my company brought on a new client and I was going to put this client through our training. Now the process for our training is to go through the virtual training first. It's an hour or two of a webinar or videos, right? And then one of my trainers or myself will come out in person and we've built this foundation of training through the internet, but there's no engagement there, right? There's no Q&A, there's no exercises. So we show up in person and then we do the Q&A. We do the engagement and we really drive the, the training home. And it's my process and I'm proud of it and I know it works. There was a client who didn't want to go through that process. They wanted me to come out and train their trainers in two hours on how to go train all of their salespeople. They didn't want me to do it at all. And I knew that wasn't gonna be effective. Um, and I was bullheaded about it and I didn't give it 100%. And things didn't work out so well with that partner. There were other factors probably. I'm, I'm sure I'm not the reason that things didn't work out with that partner, but I did not, I would, did not behave as well as I probably should have. Cut to a few years later, and another partner comes along and they have similar concerns with my virtual training. This time I take a deep breath and I just say, okay, let's do it your way. Let, my way doesn't have to be the right way. And so I remember being invited to one of their trainings where one of their people was training my stuff and they were not doing a great job. Honestly, I was sitting in the audience watching this happen and probably doing one of these things. <laughs> and, um, one of the learners asked the trainer a question that they couldn't answer. So they leaned on me. They're like, David, you're the subject matter expert. Can you answer that question? Which of course I was happy to do. And then another question came and that happened another question. And um, over time I kind of became the trainer in the room, which was not my intention, but that was what happened later on. That partner invited me to another city and another city and another city. And eventually they allowed us to put all of their reps through the virtual training too. So I ultimately got my way by being flexible, by not insisting that things had to go my way. So I hope that if you're one of those people who knows the best way to get to Dairy Queen and you see your wife driving the other way, just let her, right? It's not hurting anything. If you see someone making Kool-Aid incorrect, who cares if there's floaties on the top? That was psychotic, right? Just, Take a deep breath and remember, it doesn't have to be your way. Number two, number two lesson that I've been asked to talk about today is everyone has problems. Now, I read some biographies during my journey. It was one of my things that I really like to do. You, you might think, well, oh, I'll bet he read uh, Michelle Obama or Abraham Lincoln. No, I read Amy Poehler and William Shatner <laughs> biographies. Um, anyway, the William Shatner biography actually shed some light on something that I didn't realize. If you don't know, William Shatner was uh, Captain Kirk, right? Uh, Star Trek, universally loved by millions of people. And I come to discover reading his book that, uh, that he has a really hard time establishing and maintaining relationships in his life. And in fact, he claimed that Leonard Nimoy was his closest friend, and yet they went for 10 or 15 years without even talking to each other, and William Shatter didn't even know why that happened. So it got me thinking, if this man who is universally loved is wealthy and successful, if he's struggling with the relationships in his life, then why do I put so much pressure on myself? It's probably true of a lot of people. Um, I want to take just a, mo a moment to talk about how this important lesson is relevant in a world run by social media, right? We are guarded by social media, all of us. And um, I'm here to tell you that when you look at the newsfeed of your friends, sometimes what you see can be a little challenging to, to take, right? Like, okay, for example, 
Uh, I have a friend who, uh, who has this perfect car, right? And this brilliant house and this beautiful wife. And he goes on the perfect vacations. Um, and he's like, oh my God, every time I look at him, I feel that green eyed monster just welling up in me. And I want to be happy for him. And I try, but I just feel like, what is he doing with his life? That's so different from, from mine. Why does he get to have this life? And I'm sure people look at my social media the same way. I'm guilty of posting those things too. So here's, here's my lesson to you guys. I want you to think of social media like a house that's on the market for sale. All right, here's what I mean by that. Your realtor comes in, they want to put your house up on the market. Do they just go into your house and start taking pictures? Absolutely not, because they're going to see your daughter's lights on or <laughs> maybe missing. They're going to see, you know, uh, socks on the ground. They're going to see dirty dishes in the sink. They're going to see unmade beds. And even the things that are supposed to be there, they're going to say, take that toaster and that coffee maker and that air fryer and hide them so I can take this picture of your kitchen, right? And so what you see on the web is a house, not a home. You see a house. It's not a realistic expectation of what you're talking, what, you're, what, you're, what, what they're really living in. And I think that's true of social media too. I think that when you see those photographs of the perfect vacations and the smart children with the 4.0. Sorry. If you see that, realize there's probably stuff going on below the surface, right? In fact, um, I actually flew out to see this friend. He lived uh, on the East Coast. I hadn't seen him for many, many years, uh, but I was out there um, doing some business and I said, hey, let's get together. And I come to find out he was broke. All, all the businesses he had started were failing. Um, he was struggling with his marriage. He was having some hard times. And uh, I felt terrible, right? Here I was being envious of this person, looking at the life that they were portraying in social media. And I didn't even remember my own lesson, which is that everyone has problems. So that when you are facing those problems, don't compare yourself to other people who seem to have this perfect, perfect life. Okay. All right. Number three, sweating the traffic. Oh my gosh. Who here loves traffic? <laughs> um, I know somebody here is, uh, uh, on the webinar is in, uh, in Atlanta. So I know you love traffic, right? Um, so here's the thing. The person I described earlier, not a fun person to be around, right? Imagine me in traffic. I'm driving along with, you know, with my family. We're having a great time. And uh, the music's playing. We're singing some Taylor Swift. We love Taylor Swift. And all of a sudden, I see this person texting and driving. And I lose my mind. Like, like I, it's like Bruce Banner becoming the Hulk. Like, I just cannot even stand seeing somebody texting and driving. They're going slow, then they're going fast. They're kind of weaving a little bit. They're endangering other people on the road. I have young drivers in my home. I am really passionate about this, and I am angry, right? So you know what I did? <laughs> I would pull up next to them. I'd pull up next to them, and I'd just stare at them. Just stare at them until they finally looked up from their phones, and I'd be like, yeah. I see you. I see you texting and driving. Cut that out. I even yelled at somebody at a stoplight once. I was like, stop texting and driving. And they were like, mind your business. And then the light turned green. Thank God. Cause I don't know where that would have gone. Right. I was sweating the traffic, but not only did I read a book called don't sweat the small stuff during my journey. I also read a book called the subtle art of not giving up F. I won't say the word here, but you probably know what I'm talking about. The subtle art of not giving an F. And in that book, it really makes you focus on your priorities and what gets you all riled up and what's important to you and what's not important. And so today when I drive down the road, it's a little different. Like I don't want to ruin that entire drive for my family. I'm not the only one in the car. And me hulking out makes for a very unpleasant situation for them. And so I have learned uh, through my next lesson, which I'm about to share with you, 
a way to deal with the traffic that makes driving to work more peaceful. And frankly, nobody is a good driver. People are terrible drivers. There's all sorts of texting and driving. People are in the left lane when I want to pass them. Like at some point, you just have to realize that when you get behind the wheel, you're going to encounter these jerks. But you get to decide if you're going to have a pleasant driving experience or an unpleasant one based on how you react to the other drivers around you. So don't sweat the traffic, guys. And here is the trick to not sweating the traffic. This might be my absolute favorite lesson from the entire book. Assume good intentions. By the way, that's the, the note I have on today. Assume good intentions. Right? And a lot of it can take place in traffic, but imagine for a moment that you're at work. And um, maybe you know someone like this. Maybe you have someone like this at your work or, or maybe you've worked with someone like this in the past that they, they come in early and they stay late and they bring donuts to the boss and they're full of all these great ideas in the meetings and they're so anxious and excited and they work so hard because they want your job, right? They want your job or they want that promotion that you are up for. And they're a little brown nosing butt kisser and you know it and you can't stand them. Can you think of someone like that in your life or someone you know or someone you've known? Let me tell you something. You may be totally right about that person. They may be a jerk. They may be trying to manipulate people around them. Or they may be generous and kind and eager and they may want the entire company to succeed. They may want to provide input that helps everybody, right? What is it, a raising tide lifts all ships? They might think like that. The only difference between those two people, the butt kisser and the raised tides person, is how you experience them. That doesn't matter if they truly are one or the other. How you perceive them is how it will affect your world. And if you assume good intentions in other people, the entire world becomes this better place. There are really two kinds of people in the world. People who think that everyone is here to help them and people who think everyone's out to get them. And I would like to challenge you, think about that later today. Think about that when you're dealing with someone who's not interacting with you in the way that you would have liked them to. Are their intentions truly evil or dark or mean or selfish? Or maybe do they have good intentions, but they're just failing to live up to their to their potential. Now I'm gonna go back to traffic to really drive this home. After being on my journey for six, seven months, I'm, uh, I took my mother-in-law to um, a couple of doctor's appointments. Now this was a very long day with a lot of bad news. It was a hard day. Uh, the appointments went way longer than they should have. It's like five o'clock and we're finally coming home from the appointments. Now we're stuck in traffic. We're both in a bad mood. It's starting to get dark. It's even raining and we're hungry. It was just a bad situation, right? And this guy comes flying by me, like just like I'm sitting still. And then I see him up ahead and he's weaving in and out of traffic, like such, oh. And my mother-in-law is in the passenger seat and she says the same thing that you would say, the same thing that all of us would say. She says, what a jerk, he's endangering everyone. Why does he have to drive so fast, right? And she's getting physically agitated and, and, and you know, she's having a bad experience because of this driver. And I turned to her and without even thinking, I said, well, maybe he's got a sick little girl at home. And she looked at me like, where did that come from? And I looked at me in the rearview mirror. I was like, where did that come from? I don't even know. But I had been practicing assuming good intentions for weeks now, maybe months. And for whatever reason, in that moment, I just assumed that this guy had a really good reason for driving fast and reckless. And I know that sounds a little crazy. The reality of the situation is my mother-in-law was probably right. He probably was a jerk. He was probably listening to Twisted Sister and, and, and just cruising down the road like a maniac for no reason. 
But here's the thing. Here's the thing I want you to take away from that story. My mother-in-law and I had two very different reactions to the exact same event. She chose to decide that he had dark intentions. I chose to decide that he had good intentions. And whether or not I was right about that is irrelevant because my experience in that moment was a positive one. I wasn't agitated. I wasn't cracking my neck. I wasn't angry or fuming. I didn't hulk out. I just let the guy drive by because obviously he had a good reason for what he was doing. I know it's, it's a hard one to really portray to you guys in the, the few minutes that I have with you, but I want you to consider going about your life over the next few weeks, assuming the very best in people and tell me if it doesn't change your world. In fact, I'm going to challenge you to go on a similar journey to what I did. I'd really love to see you guys embrace uh, some books that you think would help you out, right? Would you like to read for 20 minutes a day? And can you write the lessons on your wrist? Write yourself a little note so that they'll actually take root and have an impact on you. And then act out those lessons. One thing I've discovered through this entire journey is that a person cannot change. People are who they are. And it might surprise you to hear me say that, but I truly believe that. This morning, I walked by my little girl's room and her lights were on and it angered me. I cannot change that. But what I can change is how I act about that. And so I reached in and I shut the lights off and I went about my day. I wanna challenge you guys to do that, right? Assume good intentions. Remember that you can't change who you are, but you can change how you act and how you react to the world around you. And like I said, I hope that you'll consider reading because I think that is a, a huge part of what makes us better people. Uh, and then with that, I'm gonna give you my contact information. Um, you can always Google me. I'm, you know, I should be number one on Google for David McBee. There's, a, there's also a musician, an electrician, and a real estate agent, but they don't got my SEO skills, so you won't have any trouble finding me. Um, and then with that, I just want to share a copy of my book. It's, uh, it's up on Amazon. And then, of course, I've got a podcast now. It's fairly new. There's only about 12 episodes, um, but it's available on all the places that you podcast. Well, thank you all for joining me. I really appreciate it. From Kansas City, farewell. Mm -hmm.